endeavor to speak to you today on the lesson called to be holy. How many of you believe that that's what we're supposed to do? Yeah. We're supposed to be holy. Will we accomplish that on our own? I won't. Not even close. But with God's help. But God. That's <clears throat> what Auntie would say if she was here. But God. He will help us. So I'm going to do something this morning I don't normally do. But if, with your permission, I'm going to read from the New Living Translation version. Sometimes, Sister Rich, that it's just simple in my little simple mind. And it opens it up. In a, in a little different light without changing the true meaning of it. So the reading is not long today. We're reading from 1 Peter chapter 1. We'll be reading verses 13 through 23 from the New Living Translation Version. The Bible says, So prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. And remember that the Heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. How many of you know he has no favorites? Amen. Brother Bauer, the individual that's sleeping under a bridge somewhere because he has no home, the Lord loves him just as much as he loves the most wealthy individual in the world. He has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of him during your time here as temporary residents. Temporary residents. For you know that... <clears throat> Don't let it get away from me here. I'm trying to. <clears throat> For you know that God paid a ransom to you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors, and it was not paid with mere gold or silver which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began, but now in these last days he has been revealed for your sake. Through Christ you have come to trust in God. And you have placed your faith and hope in God because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth. So now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply with all your heart. For you have been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word God. How many of you are thankful for a life that will last forever? Yeah. It's not just here for 60, 70, 80, 90 or 100 in Auntie's case years, but it's forever if we live for him and serve him. Let's pray and ask the Lord to be with us and help us today. Jesus, we love you with all of our heart. Yes, we appreciate your blessings. We appreciate an opportunity to be here. Lord, I just ask you to let there be something said, Jesus, that will talk to our hearts, that will strengthen our hearts, something that will encourage us, Lord. I have nothing to contribute, but Lord, you have everything to contribute. And I'm asking you to speak through us this morning, assist us and help us, and most of all, help us to feel your presence in a wonderful way. And we'll be careful, Lord, to give you the praise. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I almost hesitate, Brother Rich, to even bring it up because it's, it's 
what my wife went through this week and what her family went through with the sudden passing of a brother just literally here one second brother bauer and gone the next and i told my wife i said there's a part of me that wants to be sad and it hurts and i mean imagine a mama imagine a wife going through that but the other part of me says he's the winner Brother Rich, it's not temporary, it's eternal. He suffered all of his life with health problems, diabetes, heart problems. For a 40th birthday present, he got open heart surgery on his 40th birthday. But today, Brother Bauer, he's got a brand new heart. He's got a brand new body, and he will never, ever suffer again. And I'm convinced 10 seconds after he took his last breath, if you said, will you come back? He said, I don't believe I'll come back. I believe I'm out of here. But the ones left behind are the ones that need to be lifted up and need God's help. And he's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. How many of you believe that today? Amen. Go right ahead, Sister Lori. So he went to church, worshiped the Lord. He and his wife came to the altar after church, raised her at the ending of service, raised their hands and worshiped the Lord. He went home with Carl and laughed and cut up with his family. He went to the house and was brushing his teeth, and the Lord took him to heaven. Gary told me one time, and, and honest to goodness, I didn't, had not planned on any of this, but I just feel like maybe it's something that needs to be said. He told me when Gail and I first got married, way, way back there, <clears throat> in 1982, he helped us feed cattle that winter. And he said, I, I, if I can just polish the gold in heaven, that's all I want to do. He said, I don't, I don't need any special treatment up there. If I can make it and polish the gold, he said, I'd be thrilled to death. And that was Gary. If you knew him, he had a servant's heart. He would literally give you the shirt right off of his back. He'd give you anything, Brother Rich, that he had if he thought you needed it. And those of you that know him know he, he wavered a little bit down through time. He was in and out, but he never lost a love for God. Right. At, the, at his worst moment, he would still tell you, Repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and the infilling of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Like Brother Martin said in the service, when he was in a place in places <laughs> where he shouldn't be sitting, he'd still preach to them right. because it was burned into his heart. And God, in his infinite mercy that we talked about last week, brought him back, refilled him with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, helped him get his life back in order, and then just took him home. The mercy and the grace and the goodness of God. <clears throat> what does it mean to be a Christian? And I had planned on reading a lesson connection, but I can already tell we're going to run out of time here. <laughs> Brother Robert will be coming in here momentarily, so I better hurry. What does it mean to be a Christian? In its simplest form, I believe it just means to be Christ-like, to be like Jesus. And how are we supposed to do that? Because I can assure you on my own, I'm not. I can't be. It's just We deal with carnality. We deal with human nature. Psalms 46 and 1 tells us God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in, in trouble. When we're in trouble, when we know that we need God's help, he's there. He's right beside us at all times. 
And if we truly try to navigate this life on our own, Brother Bauer, we're going to have trouble. We're going to have some trouble even on our best day with the Lord helping us because this is called life. It's not heaven yet. It's life. And he, but that's why he helps us and that's why he's always there beside us and assisting us. Proverbs 18 and 24 speaks about a friend who sticks closer to us than a brother. A friend that sticketh closer than a brother. That friend is Jesus. How many of you have had him in a time of need come to you and you feel that uplifting maybe you're sad in your heart but you just have a peace and know God's got this and it's going to be okay it's going to work out all right and we say this all the time but what is our job as a as a Christian if we're supposed to be Christ-like what did Jesus do he cared he loved and he helped and it didn't matter who it was he came in contact with. He cared and he loved and he helped them. <clears throat> if we're going to tell somebody else about the Lord, then they're going to have to see his love and compassion in us. I've never been a salesman. Gail and I deal with Conklin Company and that was pretty easy for me because I didn't feel like I was selling, Brother Rich. I felt like I was sharing with others what we were using and what we had found that had worked on, on our farm. And isn't that what telling others about Jesus is all about? Just simply telling them, Sister Lori, about what he's done for us. Telling him about how he is that friend that sticketh closer than a brother. How he is that very present help in time of need. If they're going to see it with Carl, then they got to see it in us first. Because if I'm trying to tell them one thing and they're seeing something totally different in my heart and life, how far do you think I'm going to get? Actions speak louder than words. A wise man said one time, don't pay any attention to what people say. Just simply watch what they do. So if they're saying they're driving a Ford, but they're actually driving a Chevrolet, why are they driving a Chevrolet if they believe that strongly in a Ford? And that's just a very simple explanation. But if we're going to tell them about Jesus, but we're not living like Jesus, and our lives don't match up to what Jesus did, then, then they're not going to listen to me. Right, right. Why should they? Yeah. <clears throat> Why does true holiness begin with a changed mindset rather than with modified behavior? Sister Rich, I couldn't help but think of you when I, when I was studying this. What are the dangers of changing what we do without changing what we think? And the only reason that I thought of you is because of what I've heard you say. When you first come into church, you said they were telling me you got to do this, this, and this but they were getting a cart before the horse. And I'm not yeah. condemning anyone, but God will help us. Amen. He will lead us, Brother Bauer, into all truth yes. if we'll just let him. Yeah. He's more worried about what's down in here first. And then when this down in here is right, everything else will come, come yeah. together yeah. because we want to please him then. Yes, amen. <clears throat> I can't help, pardon my reference to, to Brother Grissom, but it used to make him so mad, Brother Bauer. You just get someone started in church. I mean, <laughs> and somebody would beeline for him now. And, and just what you testified about, oh, Sister yeah. Rich. You got to do this, 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 and this. He said, leave them alone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> leave them alone. <laughs> the Lord will work that out. I'll talk to them when that time comes. It's not time yet. Right, They're right. babies. When a baby's born by the Carl, we don't expect, we don't feed him a T-bone steak. You know, you and I might be settled into one on the table, but we don't cut a piece off and feed that baby a bite of steak. He's not ready yet. <laughs> and I'm moving on, Pastor. The rest of it's up for you. It's up to you. <laughs> what, what 
John 16 and 13, as I mentioned a moment ago, tells us that he will lead us and guide us into all truth. Why did the song say it took him just a week to make the moon and the stars? The sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars and Brother Robert mentions it all the time, but he's still working on me. After all these years, 1982, my wife and I got married and, and we've been right there sitting there ever since and he's still working on me, Sister Linda. And I appreciate the fact he's left me around to work on me because I'm not perfect. I have problems. I have things that he has to work through my life and out of my life and try to try to help me to be right when that day comes I want to be right more than anything in the world I want to be right with him and I'm getting ready to close on our own we can't live a life of true holiness because we were born into sin we were shaping into iniquity but the beautiful part is we're not on our own right we're here with his help to help us and assist us along the way. And that's why we need the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is God's spirit living inside of us. It's a difference maker. God's spirit living inside of us. He's the one that makes a difference in our life. On our own, we're just carnal human beings full of imperfections. But Jesus came and gave his life to wash away our imperfections and to help us to be more like him. And as I mentioned a moment ago, I was going to read Lesson Connection. How many of you read it? Did any, any of you read it? <clears throat> Talked about the, I think probably, even Brother Bauer, as young as he is, he might be old enough to remember. How old were you in 1990, Pastor? Ten years old. Okay, so do you remember the Hubble telescope, the launching of it? That's what the lesson connection was speaking of. I think so, maybe, yeah. They're not in here yet. Maybe maybe we do have time. <laughs> can I can I back up just a little bit? And the reason I wanted to do that is because the the last part ties it all together. So if you'll bear with me just a moment, we'll run through it. You may recall the great fanfare surrounding the launch of the famed Hubble Space Telescope in 1990. Its impact on astronomy is nothing short of revolutionary. Hubble has offered us stunning images of our universe. In its decades of operation, Hubble has recorded over 1.5 million observations, including locations that are 13.4 billion light years from Earth. Analysis of those observations has resulted in over 19,000 published scientific papers. How many of you remember the Hubble now? <clears throat> However, the Hubble mission came within a hair's breadth of total failure. Shortly after its launch, when Hubble began sending back its first images, scientists discovered a flaw in Hubble's primary mirror. It was known as a spherical aberration and it prevented the mirror from focusing light on the same point. Because of the flaw, Hubble operated at only a fraction of its true capacity. Part of what made Hubble unique was its existence as a space telescope operating without the interference of atmospheric distortions or human light pollution to cloud its images. However, this fact meant repairing Hubble would be astronomically expensive. For a time, NASA contemplated returning the Hubble back to Earth and completely replacing its primary mirror. However, experts working in Baltimore, Maryland and in Boulder, Colorado came up with a different plan. By 1993, NASA had already developed an upgraded version of Hubble's wide field planetary camera with optical adjustments that compensated for the flaw in the mirror. Taking that design as their cue, engineers created the Corrective Optics Space Telescope Axial Replacement. That's a mouthful. Basically, the engineers created a pair of glasses for Hubble. The challenge was finding a way to make CoStar, and that's, that's all that mouthful I just read you, durable enough to withstand a space launch, but delicate enough to insert into its mirror 
array without disturbing any other components. According to Smithsonian curator David Dvorkin, the solution came to a ball aerospace engineer while showering in a German hotel where he admired the ingenious design of their shower heads. Happily, Hubble's new pair of glasses functioned even better than expected. During Hubble's 30th anniversary year of 2020, NASA celebrated its successes by releasing a series of images including the famous Cosmic Reef image, a breathtaking image of giant red nebula NCG 2014 and its neighboring blue nebula NGC 2020, a staggering 163,000 light years away. Here's the astounding part of the story. The flaw that almost caused the Hubble mission to fail was less than 1 50th the thickness of a human hair. For all intents and purposes, it was an invisible flaw, but it had a devastating visible consequence. Those flaws that are in our lives, those flaws that are in my life, I'll leave you guys out of it, they can have a devastating consequence. Sure. And then I read that so I could leave you with this. Carnival Funhouse Mirrors and their wavy warped distortions of our reflections can be funny, sometimes frightening, but never forgotten. Without fail, they always seem to emphasize our worst aspects. Considering those experiences, it is unsettling to hear Peter proclaim that we are called to reflect the holiness of God. If a flaw smaller than a human hair could almost destroy Hubble's effectiveness, what damage do our own spiritual flaws due to our witness for Jesus Christ. This question is sobering because it points to an awesome responsibility. We have, all have been reminded that we are the only Jesus that many non-believers will ever see. How do we represent him? It is easy to be short with the clumsy bag boy at the grocery store. Any of us? <laughs> when we're in a hurry and people just doodling around. But you know what? I need their mercy. I doodle around sometimes too, Brother Rich. Or snap back at the rude sales representative over the phone or to glare at the driver who cuts us off on the highway. We've never done that, have we? <laughs> it's just where we live, church. <laughs> this is just, this is life. It's where we live. Tiny little flaws, but they add up to a distorted reflection of the one who gave us endless mercy and love. Peter was clear on this point. We are called to be holy in all manner of conversation. Driving habits, eating habits, oh Lord, conversations, clothing choices, entertainment choices, they all fall within the domain, the domain of this call to holiness. Those who wish to reduce holiness to a list of rules should be warned. That list will be endless. Holiness encompasses every choice in life. Only when we have proper sense of the daunting demands of holiness are we prepared to comprehend the awe of our salvation. When Peter wrote, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy. His emphasis was not the demand placed upon us, but the provision given to us. The holiness we are called to reflect is the holiness that God supplies, is the gift of divine holiness that moves us forward on the path toward final salvation. As we call on the Father, the grace of the gospel fixes our flaws and deals with our distortions. In the old life, we fashioned ourselves according to worldly lust. In the new life provided in Christ, God is fashioning us according to his character and his purpose. We are being actively and daily transformed by the power of the Spirit to be more like him. Each day that we strive to live out unfeigned love, the family resemblance to Jesus Christ is stronger, and we become shining witnesses of the glory of salvation. How are we going to represent him if he doesn't dwell down in here? Without his help, without his love, and without his mercy, 
I'm a total failure. But because of his help and his love and his mercy, we have an opportunity to be here today. We have an opportunity to raise a hand, Pastor, after you preach in a little bit, to come down here to worship and to magnify him. Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he's with us, he helps us through all these things. How many of you are thankful for Jesus and an opportunity to serve him? Lord bless you. I love every one of you.